Now, speaker number three, Claire Bayon, is an artist, writer, and researcher. Based in Broad Bay, she works on a range of projects with fellow artists, writers, and scientists, also musicians from here and abroad. Claire facilitates Many as One. This is an arts and peace initiative whose purpose is to foster on and offline networks of creative exchange. Now, for five years, she's co-curated Tuesday Poem, an international web-based poetry collective. And a few years ago, Claire spent two summers in Antarctica working with US polar biologists who were studying one of the strangest creatures in the world called Fora minifera. Did I pronounce that correctly? Not quite? You'll, re you'll correct me later. Okay, thank you. Claire became captivated and inspired by the skill and artistry of these masons of the unicellular world. And her presentation is titled, Nature's Little Masons. Please, a big warm pucky pucky. Welcome to Explorers Cove, New Harbour, Antarctica. So today I'm going to introduce you to a group of unicellular artists, architects and masons of the microscopic world. And I will share the bones of a collaborative project that I worked on that involves these organisms and two South African artists um, and US polar biologists, Sam Bowser and me from Dunedin. So I'd never heard of foraminifera that are called forams for short until I encountered them on the ice on my first trip in 2005. They are ordinarily invisible to the naked eye, but in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean, they are giants, especially in the icy waters around McMurdo Sound. So foraminifera form the base of our evolutionary pyramid. They perform a wide range of tasks, amongst these the sequestering of carbon and the cycling and recycling of nutrients from their ocean floor habitat. The research team that I was with in Antarctica has been studying these little tiny critters for two and a half uh, decades, and each year they return to the same remote field camp. You can just make out our two orange Jamesways to the left of this photograph. And beside, behind them were the Taylor Dry Valleys. You can also see that the sea ice in this um, photograph is, which was in front of our camp, was ragged and choppy and littered with volcanic grit. We were surrounded by trapped icebergs and hanging glaciers. I found it heart-stoppingly beautiful. So in addition to a long list of camp duties, a good many hours each day were spent peering down microscopes in a makeshift lab, sorting and identifying these foraminifera that were collected twice daily by divers. I was entranced by the skill and artistry of these tiny, very early life forms and by their creative repertoire and their expressions of intelligence. So I popped this slide in as a matter of interest to those of us who live in Dunedin because during his visits to New Zealand, Sam and I would spend time sample collecting in places like Portobello Estuary, Warrington and Waipuna Bay. He wondered whether our Dunedin forams might be a bridging species between those that are found in the northern and southern um, oceans, which would be very interesting. He took some back to his lab to, to look into. So there are four different groups of foraminifera, calcareous, agglutinated, naked, and soft-bodied. I'll be focusing in only on the agglutinated species tonight, because it, it was their masonry that really fascinated me so much. Agglutinated forams construct their tests or their cell bodies by gluing little sedimentary grains together. So they send their sticky little pseudopodia out into the environment and they collect little particles and they build these very elaborate shells. Certain species will work only with transparent stones. It was so fascinating. Under the microscope, there's one called Astromena um, triangularis that would light up like a little stained glass window or a, an elaborate Byzantine dome. Very beautiful. Other species selected only opaque stones, all of a consistent size. Still others built their structures with apparently random sedimentary material, only to complete their homes with one red stone. How did they know that? How did they distinguish the color red and why did they do this? Still others, like Silver Sacomina on the right-hand side, would line their constructions with titanium, 
and Christianina Mamilla on the left hand side at the bottom decorates his shell with sponge spicules, probably just for decoration like a hermit crab might. It's crazy to think that this two centimetre tree foram, which is carnivorous, is actually a single celled creature. So I'll introduce you to Christina Bryo, who's a Cape Town based uh, ceramic artist. She, um, we, we asked her if she would create a series of work to take down to the ice, and she was especially drawn to the foram Astromena triangularis, which is affectionately known as Euclid. And she has great interest in periodicity and mathematics, so it's not hard to see why. These are some of the pieces that she made that we took down to the ice. And this is my dear friend Catherine, one of my oldest friends, um, who created a very beautiful series of bell vessels out of high-fired porcelain. And she gave them to us to play as instruments around the ice. And they, when you strike them with a soft-headed drumstick, they sound like a bell. And it was just seemed like the perfect accompaniment to the sea ice, the wind, and um, yeah, just the environment. It was so, so perfectly suited. This slide shows our transport. And this slide shows a dive hole at a place called Cape Bernacki, which was about an hour and a half drive from Explorers Cove. It was an especially abundant uh, collection site. The ice was some 60 to 70 feet thick here and was quite a business melting a dive hole, you can imagine. <laughs> a foam biscuit um, lid would prevent the hole from freezing over in between dives. This is Sam entering the dive hole with one of Catherine's vessels. I very much wished that I could do this. I wanted so much to experience this under ice environment personally. This image shows um, some of, uh, one of Christina's porcelain forams on the ocean floor, surrounded by creatures who seemed very eager to interact with it. <laughs> and these are three of Catherine's beautiful porcelain uh, vessels on the floor of the ocean uh, in the company of a sea sponge and a hydra and of an abundance of foraminifera. Transporting them was a very tricky business. We had to pack them up very carefully and drive them in these very old skidoos around the ice. Some of them got broken. But the broken shards are very beautiful too. So what we did was we collected them all up and Sam took them back to the lab where he had a special instrument that um, was called something like a particle tumbler. And what it did was it would tumble these shards and break them down into dust-sized um, particles that would be approximately the same size as the sediments, that, um, the, the grains that they would choose in their natural habitat. And we wondered what would happen if we gave these porcelain dust particles to the forams to construct art. So to bring things full circle, these chalky cliffs of Dover are composed of a palimpsest of fossils. So Catherine and uh, Christina's clay composed of materials that contained the bodies of the forams. And so what we did was we gave them the material, they built these new sculpture forms with the bodies of their ancestors. <laughs> so I think I've finished, have I? <laughs>